Greetings everybody, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, based on wherever you are. Welcome to my talk on modern Red Team Tradecraft. I'd like to start off by thanking you all for viewing my talk and also a huge thank you to the brilliant team behind DEFCON Red Team Village for putting together over 200 hours of content on Red Teaming. So massive props to Omar and the team. All right, quick introduction. I'm a senior consultant at Mandiant. My job involves simulating an adversary, otherwise known as red teaming or purple teaming. I also keep a keen eye out on tradecraft and the tactics, techniques, and procedures used by the most sophisticated threat actors out there. I'm first time DEF CON speaker, so yay. And you can reach out to me on Twitter at Sajal underscore Thomas. Most important, importantly, the opinions in the stock are mine and not my employers. Quick disclaimer here. Right, so the agenda for today is going to be a range of topics. Uh, we are going to cover why help offense to begin with and then we'll spend some time on talking about implant design considerations and OPSEC decisions that a red team operator would require to make in order to sufficiently simulate a sophisticated adversary. We'll talk about how offense informs defense and there's also a short section on credential harvesting because naturally no red team talk is complete without a topic on credential harvesting. Lastly, we'll cover how someone can get into red teaming and also how the modern red teamer needs to evolve and skill up in order to adequately simulate some of the sophisticated adversaries out there. At the end, we'll open up the floor for questions on the Discord server, so please feel free to leave questions during the course of the talk as well as uh, right at the end. Alright, so the big question is why help offense in the first place? Why spend time and energy in improving a team that merely serves the purpose of keeping you on your toes? So, before we get into that, let's quickly rewind the clock. To the peak of the Cold War era to draw some inspiration from clandestine intelligence and counterintelligence operations. So what you're looking at is the glorious A12 reconnaissance plane. This was built by Lockheed back in the 60s and the purpose of this plane was to collect intelligence on the ground by uh, flying through certain sensitive areas and the main objective of this plane was reconnaissance and surveillance and uh, this plane was also known as the Archangel and also uh, in, in classified, declassified documents it was called uh, the Oxcart plane um, and thanks to all the declassified documents we now know a lot more about this plane and about how the United States had to keep it hidden from the Soviets spying eyes. So the Area 51 personnel uh, that was operating on this plane um, and Area 51 was the hangar where the plane was uh, being developed and tested. Uh, the personnel there soon realized that they would need to keep the plane hidden from Soviet spy satellites who in return would be capturing images of the plane from up above so in order to hide it they would quickly scoot it into a building as soon as they would learn that a spy satellite was uh, about to enter into the area 51 airspace and td barnes a former hypersonic flight specialist used to say that if a plane happened to be out in the open uh, when the satellite was coming over the horizon they would quickly scoot it into a building and he would say that the entire hangar would look like a parking lot. He said that it would look like after all the cars have left you can still see how many were parked there 
in infrared because of the difference in the ground temperatures. So as you can see, uh, all the A12 planes parked in the hangar with uh, the shadows that, leave, that, that they left behind on the ground. So the difference in the temperatures and the heat signatures on the ground where they were parked were naturally much different to the heat signatures of the entire hangar. And so it turned out that even with all the laborious hooting and scooting of the planes in and out of buildings, the US spies learned that the Soviets had managed to get their hands on a drawing of the A-12 plane. Uh, and they assumed that they got it via the infrared satellites. So in order to thwart these infrared satellites, the Area 51 crew began constructing fake planes out of cardboard and other mundane materials uh, in order to cast misleading shadows for the Soviet spy satellites to keep wandering over. And uh, it, we, we, we also know now that sometimes the, the hangar staff would fire up heaters near these imaginary engine locations to make it appear as if the planes had just landed. And so as red teamers and as, as professionals who are trying to simulate an apex adversary, what are the lessons here for us? The lessons here are that every apex adversary knows which action leaves what trace behind. And by knowing this, by knowing which signals are exposed to defenders, advers adversaries can mislead observers in the opposite direction. So naturally, if you know that your uh, your enemy or uh, your observer is is monitoring your heat signatures, then what you can do is throw them off by uh, planting fake heat signatures and confusing them. So that was one of the lessons that I gathered from this story. And the other one is that when stealth becomes a necessity, um, and on the other hand, if it affects the pace of the operation, then then what do you do? Do you give up stealth and expose yourself, or do you continue to remain stealthy, but not move in the direction of your objective? This is a question that every red team operator has faced or will face at some point in every operation. But we can conclude that having a formidable adversary to practice against does keep you on your toes and um, knowing every action and every signal that you leave behind does help you understand how you can improve yourself and by improving yourself how you can improve uh, the blue team, which is the defense. So, back in um, 2013, Lockheed Martin announced the SR-72, which um, and and they announced it with this huge slogan saying "Speed is the new stealth," and they said that um, the the plane goes so fast that it's it's going to be invisible to radars and it's going to be undetectable in the air but from a red team operator's point of view is speed really the new stealth now there, there's a there's a line of thought among red team operators that going in and getting out very quickly is something that's most worthy i i myself am a victim to this i have boasted many a times that I got DA on day one and I completed this objective and that objective within a few days and, and that was it. Um, but truly, does this impact really help the defense achieve their goals or uh, does this help the defense to get better themselves or, or does spending a lot more time and remaining undetected demonstrate more impact? to the blue team. Now, the defensive tech has um, set a new precedent. There's a lot of behavioral analysis and baselining what is normal on an endpoint, on a network, and what, what happens is that anything that 
goes beyond that normal or anything that comes off as an anomaly immediately generates an alert and and so allow me to share a war story of mine where I performed a curb burst attack and I pulled 30 service account um, curb burst TGS tickets within a few seconds uh, because that's that's the default action when you perform any sort of curb burst attack straight out of the box whether it's via Rubius or whether you use the PowerShell script um, PowerView by, by picking invoke curb roast the default is that it will just curb roast every single service ticket that's uh, in the active directory so um, what happened is that defenders were watching for quantity of requests and um, they were watching that quantity uh, in the given time frame that I um, generated all those service ticket requests and they picked up this anom anomaly and unfortunately that was the end of my foothold so uh, this is from the blog by uh, at debug privilege on Twitter uh, it's a blog on hunting for uh, tactics techniques and procedures using Azure Sentinel and what debug privilege talks about is that how requesting a huge number of Kerberos service tickets counts as an OPSEC failure because uh, if you if you were to look at the data from 30 days and establish a baseline of service ticket requests uh, I'm sorry Kerberos service account ticket requests then you can you can have a very uh, informed idea about how many requests or how many uh, Kerberos tickets are requested per user per day and and then you can set a threshold and anything that goes above that threshold can just be deemed suspicious so to conclude maybe speed is not the new stealth for red team operations and maybe boasting about speed may not be the right approach to demonstrate impact okay so let's talk about certain red team implant design considerations that will help you achieve your objectives and also simulate a sophisticated adversary keep in mind that we are going to be talking about red team implants alone we are not we are not going to pick apart um, any of the implants used by apt actors right so let's say you want to start from scratch and you do not want to rely on a commercial or open source tool what are the few considerations you'd want to take into account to achieve this goal? So typically this would depend entirely on what kind of adversary you're simulating. If you, if you want to simulate uh, an APT group, then you would want to focus a lot more on stealth. Whereas if you were simulating a criminal or a ransomware group, then you'd naturally want to spend a lot more time on speed and you'd want to spend uh, more time on making your implant um, able to infect a lot more uh, variety of hosts so uh, you would not want to restrict it to only a certain operating system for example because you want to uh, deploy it at scale so some of the considerations that you would take into account would be to pick a language to pick a structure of your toolkit uh, to pick a strategy to execute your post exploitation capability because uh, you don't want to um, you don't want to have your entire implant with all the post exploitation capability in it and we're going to talk about why in the next slide and for inspiration uh, the first thing you can do is to look at the release notes of cobalt strike because there's there's a lot to learn from the evolution of cobalt strikes beacon in the past few years so my personal recommendation would be to write in C or C++ because this gives you the freedom and the flexibility to interact with the native Windows 32 API, um, also known as Win32 API. And the, the structure that you would want to implement would be to write modular libraries for each post-exploitation capability. So each capability should be a separate module. So if you have, uh, if you want to keylog, then your keylogger should be a separate capability and that separate that, that capability should be 
a separate library. So not only is this easier to maintain and upgrade, but there's an OPSEC benefit here, like I was mentioning in the previous slide, that if the key, mo uh, if the key logging module gets burned, then at least the rest of your modules remain safe. So you're not just deploying your implant with all the capabilities in it and injecting it into the memory of your victim. What you want to do ideally is to have separate modules for, for all your different capabilities and then uh, use them um, as per your need. And you also want to decide how to approach injecting your capabilities. So there's two, there are two major options here. One is the fork and run option, which Cobalt Strike uses as well. So this, this approach is essentially creating a sacrificial process and injecting your capability into it, uh, letting it complete, and then closing the process and killing the process. So that is one option. The other option is to inline execute into your own process. So the process that you're uh, running under, uh, the process which your implant is running under, you inject your capability into this very same process and, um, and you let the job complete. Now, there are caveats for both. Um, the fork and run is naturally uh, a lot less stealthy and uh, I'll explain why in the in the next few slides and the inline execute option is is much more stealthy but it runs the risk of destabilizing your implant process so my personal recommendation is that if you have processes or if you have capabilities that you want to run over a long period of time then you you pick the fork and run option and if there are um, smaller capabilities or capabilities that um, run for a much shorter time frame then you just inline execute them into your own process uh, also cobalt strike has this feature um, which is a newly launched feature called uh, the uh, ability to make beacon object files and uh, i'm not going to get into the details of how that works but um, essentially beacon object files now allow you to inline execute capabilities into your own process instead of the typical fork and run so this is a move that promotes stealth but also uh, like I mentioned there are some caveats to that so um, so great so you're operating in memory and uh, that's that's perfect that's what you want you don't want to touch disk all that is great but that doesn't mean that you will remain undetected it does mean in memory does mean undetectable sub t uh, also known as casey smith once tweeted and uh, in typical sub t fashion uh, deleted his tweet about the three pillars of endpoint detection and response where he said that uh, there are three things that 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 form the pillars of uh, edr and the three pillars are parent-child process relationships, uh, command line arguments, and network connections made by processes. Now, uh, this makes a lot of sense from an EDR point of view. And from a red teamer's point of view, if we were to bake these evasions into the implant design, then uh, we can have a sufficiently OPSEC safe and stealthy implant. Now, thanks to Will's talk at Wild West Hacking Fest, we already have the evasions for the first two pillars. And the last one is something we can actually do manually or um, we can program that logic into our implant uh, in order to pick processes that um, are typically known to make network connections and use them if we want to make certain network connections uh, inside the network or egressing from the network. So when a process launches, uh, EDR solutions check for anomalies. So the typical examples include word.exe spawning partial.exe and, and then uh, for command line arguments, 
this is uh, the the typical detection for that is looking for suspicious parameters like a PowerShell hyphen uh, execution policy and uh, um, proc, proc dump hyphen m lsaster txe uh, hyphen accept eula and the network connections are of course uh, uh, fairly straightforward if you see uh, if EDRC is explorer.exe making connections to the internet, then this is naturally something that's going to uh, come across as suspicious. So these are some of the ways that EDR performs the very basic uh, detections. Now, let's quickly talk about parent process spoofing. Um, this isn't a new technique. This was blogged by DDR Stevens almost 11 years ago and in order to understand how parent process spoofing works let's first look at the very basics let's let's look at the win32 api call to create a process and what this looks like is uh, a function called create process a with certain parameters and the parameter that we are interested here is um, the LP startup info a parameter. So we want to make LP startup info point to an extended startup info struct called startup info xa. The struct startup info xa contains an attribute list called LP attribute list. And the attribute list can be updated using the function update proc thread attribute. So as you can see, the LP value parameter can specify which process, which parent process you want to choose for, for the process that you create. So LP value will be a pointer to the handle to the process which you want to spoof as the parent, as you can see in the image below. And this is proof of concept code from XPN, also known as uh, Adam Chester. You can observe the update prop thread attribute function, which uh, takes uh, at um, ampersand p handle as the argument, and um, that in itself is the handle to uh, an open process call to the specific process ID that we pick. Right, so the second evasion technique talks about spoofing command line arguments. Um, as as I mentioned previously, uh, EDR looks at this quite closely. There are many such examples. Um, I mentioned Procmon, uh, which which dumps the uh, LSAS memory. Um, certain other examples also include uh, WMIC OS get uh, slash format with with a web URL pointing pointing to an XSL style sheet, which uh, is also known as Squibly2, which was an attack discovered by Casey Smith uh, a while back. And in order to evade this, uh, this detection mechanism, what we would do is to we would first create a process, suspend its state, change the command line parameters in the memory to something harmless, and then resume the process. But in order to, to do that, we first need to understand what a process environment block is, also known as PEB. Now, a PEB is mapped inside the process's virtual memory. It contains information about the process, such as loaded modules, command line, command line arguments used, and uh, other such uh, information related to the process. And like I mentioned, the few steps involved in this process would be to create a process in the suspended state and then get the address of the PEB using the NT query information process function call. This is something that tools like Process Hacker also do, and uh, that is how uh, XPN took ins inspiration um, in order to do this. And what you do next is you replace the command line. Uh, arguments stored in the PEB using write process memory and then you just resume the memory so when you see it 
when you see the logs what you will see is the harmless parameters are uh, are logged and not the ones that you started the process with so poc code yet again by adam chester uh, as you can see the the spoof parameters uh, right at the bottom but you start with reading uh, the uh, PEB from the target process using a read process memory call uh, right at the top of the image and then you get the process parameters from the PEB using uh, read process memory yet again uh, and using the handle to the process and you replace um, the suspicious parameters with uh, something harmless using write process memory and pointing to the PEB. The other interesting feature lets you prevent third-party DLLs from injecting into the uh, process space of your implant. Um, if you will recall, in September 2018, Chrome 69 uh, started this feature where it began blocking third-party software from injecting into the Chrome's process space. Um, they did this to enhance the stability of Chrome and uh, this feature gave inspiration to Raphael Mudge, creator of Cobalt Strike, to bake this into uh, Cobalt Strike's payload, which is called Beacon. And uh, for those of you familiar with Beacon, you know that this is something we can achieve by using the block DLLs command. And what block DLLs essentially does under the hood is that it creates a process with an attribute that disallows any third party DLLs from injecting into the spawn processes. So think fork and run processes of Beacon for its post -ex exploitation and uh, the block DLLs feature combined with it. So any new process you create in order to inject capability into it, you can also set this a feature into it so that it prevents any third-party DLLs from injecting into your sacrificial post-exploitation processes. Uh, the caveat here of course is that um, only Microsoft signed DLLs can inject into these processes. Uh, anything that's not signed by Microsoft cannot. And also we can also uh, use arbitrary code guard which uses a process mitigation policy to achieve similar results. So uh, looking at the code, you'll see uh, the familiar update prop thread attribute function call yet again. What is happening here is that uh, the create process function call is used along with the startup info x a uh, struct, which we talked about earlier. And uh, in this case, this struct contains the mitigation policy, which uh, prevents non-Microsoft signed DLLs from being uh, injected. So when you observe this process, you'll see that uh, there's a mitigation policy set which uh, will specify signature restricted to Microsoft only. Um, of course, as, as everything uh, sophisticated, the, the level of sophistication of your uh, activity will give away your intent. Um, if, if you're uh, protected processes uh, are something that are not normal to the environment that you're operating in then it is going to stick out like a sore thumb so the best advice here is of course to blend in by en enumerating the mitigation policies on all the processes that are running and then act accordingly so for every apex adversary it's very important for you to know your toolkit and uh, as red teaming advances and becomes more mature uh, this becomes more and more important because knowing what your toolkit does under the hood is absolutely essential now going back to our initial point uh, every action by an attacker leaves a trace behind for uh, for an attacker to reach a certain level of sophistication it is crucial to understand uh, each action and its detection risk. Uh, this often means, uh, for a red team operator, this means that the fewer processes you create, the stealthier this would be 
the image on the right is uh, is actually a screenshot of Rafael Mudge's uh, excellent uh, nine-part video series on red team operations. Uh, I'm going to touch upon that uh, in the very last section of the talk. But uh, what you see here is uh, every action and every detection risk that is tied to it from a Sysmon perspective. So you can see red is naturally uh, more expensive and by expensive uh, we mean risky and uh, the ones that stick out here are the create remote thread calls the process create calls and process access so process access includes everything from injection uh, to hash dump to running mimikatz and all the green ones are the relatively safer actions so um, file create is a very safe option uh, it's not something that's going to uh, ring alarm bells all over because this is something that happens on every endpoint and you can't possibly have alerts set for that because you'd, you'd have a huge ton of false positives uh, process termination is also safe uh, time stopping stomping I'm sorry uh, is surprisingly a safe activity Right, so at every stage of a red team operation, you will be required to make an informed decision about whether your action is uh, going to generate an alert or outright get blocked. And based on that, you will then decide how you want to proceed with uh, achieving your objectives. So the caveat here is that Actions that are loud aren't necessarily always blocked or caught straight off the bat. And uh, Raphael sums this up very well when he says that observable does not mean observed. So the strategy is to blend in with the legitimate host and network activity. This is something that Raphael terms as session prepping. And what he means by that is that you observe the endpoint and its behavior and merge with it. Uh, my personal recommendation is that you you may have to change up your session prepping based on the kind of activity you want to perform or the kind of post exploitation capability that you want to perform and um, to give you an example for something like uh, a network reconnaissance you will want to appear as a process that frequently makes a lot of network connections internally so here what I would do is I would try to uh, observe every single process that's making internal network connections and try to masquerade as one of them and also bypassing the three pillars of EDR will only help your initial foothold they'll only get you so far uh, what you do after that whether you stay hidden is entirely on the operator Disabling logging instrumentation is also something that's it's gaining a fair amount of popularity these days. It's not something uh, that a third party third party red team typically does. Uh, why is that? It's because you're testing your customer's blue team at the end of the day. And if they agree to disabling login, then uh, then naturally we have we have a few options in terms of uh, some of the new ETW bypasses that have come to light and some of the Sysmon evasions uh, and unloading of Sysmon that uh, have been blocked about in the past few years. So these are some of the options we have but again this is not something we typically do on uh, red team engagements. So uh, coming back to the point about blending in your first step should always be to enumerate the running processes and their parent child relationships once you have a decent idea of what's running you you pick a parent and a child relationship of a process uh, that you want to masquerade as and uh, and you configure it on your uh, on your implant so this is something that you should have the option to do on the fly and not something that you have to hard code and just stick with for the rest of the engagement because uh, like I said this is something 
that you may want to change based on the activity that you perform. Some common examples that you will see on the endpoints will be uh, browser parent process. Now, um, Internet Explorer used to have it with one uh, parent process uh, called iExplore.exe and then all the tabs that you subsequently open would also show up as child processes of that one parent process iExplore.exe. Uh, there are other such examples. One of them is uh, JUSCED.exe and JUSCheck.exe. These are the, the Java updater uh, parent child processes and uh, both of these are good options in order to blend in because um, they typically make network connections to the internet. So like I was mentioning, uh, internet, internet Explorer running on an endpoint would look something like this, where there's one parent process and then the tabs that are opened show up as child processes uh, of iExplorer.exe. Uh, another quick note about Rubius, uh, when you're performing Kerberost, uh, I'm sorry, not a note about Rubius, but uh, about Kerberosting in general, uh, this is something that uh, I'm going to bring up once again uh, when we talk about how offense informs defense, because it's, uh, like I mentioned, it's something that uh, very often tends to give us a lot of success in terms of domain privilege escalation. So a quick note about that, uh, I would recommend not pulling all the tickets at once. Um, as you know, I learned this the hard way because I, I pulled uh, all the service tickets at once and that led to a detection and an alert and an incident and subsequently my foothold was isolated. So an effective strategy here would be to find the service account set with the earliest password set um, so naturally these service accounts have the password last set attribute on their domain object and that is something you can query um, and the great thing about Rubius is that you can now do that with uh, a flag called uh, stats so you just need to do uh, rubius.exe kubarost slash stats and it will give you uh, the encryption types as well as the the password last set year uh, along with the number of service accounts uh, that had its password last set in that year and then uh, once you get this information what i would do is then is that i would then start pulling tickets from the oldest to newest and if the oldest cracks then uh, then brilliant uh, if it doesn't then i uh, move on to the more recent one and then uh, consequently progress to uh, the more latest password last set dates. So as I mentioned previously when performing internal network reconnaissance you would want to appear as a process that frequently makes internal network uh, connections. Um, a good trick here is to replicate the client's uh, host as a VM as closely as possible and then test all your actions and observe activity from, from a blue team's perspective. Uh, and you can use Sysmon for this uh, all day because it's free and uh, you can also use uh, Swift on Security's uh, Sysmon config that's uh, available publicly on, uh, on the GitHub repository. And by doing so, you can then look at the process relationships, the command line arguments and the network connections that your implant is making and how it's appearing on the endpoint. You'd also go a long way if you get familiar with some common uh, quote-unquote normal Windows parent-child process relationships uh, and Samir on Twitter posted this very informative chart with uh, all of these examples which uh, I refer to very often when I want to masquerade as something legitimate and I strongly recommend that you um, you refer to this chart. All right, so offense informs defense, and that is why we want to get better at offense. Um, and we want to go from the observable to the observed. Uh, 
and we want to help the blue team uh, to observe our activity so that they can defend against threats better so to detect parent uh, process id spoofing you would want to start collecting data from event tracing for windows now event tracing for windows was actually designed for debugging and not for security monitoring but that being said it is gaining popularity to gather granular information about activity performed on the host so to detect parent process id spoofing you'd want to collect the event header process id via etw and correlate with what process uh, parent process id you're seeing um, of the process also uh, pro parent process id spoofing requires creating processes with the extended startup information um, and you'd want to monitor your process creation calls uh, which have such information this point is referring to the startup info x a struct and uh, that is a necessity um, if you want to perform PPID spoofing because only with that struct can you provide the handle uh, of the process that you want to spoof as your parent and uh, naturally you want to watch out for false positives because uh, parent process ID spoofing is actually something that UAC does um, and this is legitimate behavior so uh, you, you're bound to have a few false positives but as long as you know what you're looking for um, you should be good to go a quick um, image posted by uh, the good people at F-Secure uh, this shows the um, you can see the uh, event generated by ETW and quite obviously the event header process ID and the parent process ID are different and the event header process ID shows uh, the actual parent which is 9224 uh, process ID 9224 I also want to talk about uh, a concept that Jared Atkinson of Spectre Ops uh, talked about in his blog uh, he said that we have this funnel of fidelity when it comes to detection uh, and blue teaming the idea here is that the funnel uh, at each stage exists to filter out noise in a calculated way but also affects the ability of a future step to be successful so uh, as you can see you may have a million events in your detection funnel but uh, with all the filters you have in place uh, be it um, filters of technology or, or uh, a human eye uh, everything you have in place should um, provide output to the very next filter which would take that output as its input so when you're triaging you should have a lot fewer alerts that you want to send to the next phase uh, this is because investigating uh, a hundred alerts or uh, or even a hundred thousand uh, events is fairly infeasible no matter how large the organization is and as Subti puts it in his talk uh, along with Ross Wolf uh, called Fantastic Red Teams uh, and how to find them he says that uh, behaviors happen over time and we need to monitor where the where the action happens so for example svchost.exe being spawned without the hyphen k command line uh, parameter is something that's uh, quite obviously suspicious and uh, svchost.exe being spawned not as a child of services.exe is also something that you should be looking at because the normal process relationship of svc host is um, as a child of services.exe and uh, again with the, uh, uh, the command line parameters have hyphen k and uh, the name of the service after that so uh, another such uh, odd behavior would be system level processes being spawned by non-system parents this usually indicates some level of local privilege escalation wherein your um, non-system parent process is generating a system level uh, escalated privilege process so uh, the idea would be to locate attempts to blend in 
and uh, also look at legitimate binaries being renamed um, or being replaced and put in a different directory which is not its uh, standard directory you would also go a long way if you find um, processes which are creating network connections uh, but these processes are part of the living of the land binaries so uh, lol bins as you call it another great blog post by Gerald revolves around his philosophy of detecting attacker capabilities he calls this the concept of capability abstraction so the, uh, the idea here is that an attacker's tools are merely an abstraction of their attack capabilities and detection engineers must understand how to evaluate abstraction while building detection logic so what he means is that when an attacker runs let's say uh, invoke Kerberos or Rubius or uh, Mimikatz then these present itself as detection opportunities at many levels uh, so first is the managed code itself um, and the other is the underlying uh, win32 API call that is being used and uh, it could also be the RPC call on the network that you could build your detection uh, off of and uh, lastly of course the network protocol that you can monitor for, for suspicious activity so speaking of mimikatz let's jump to credential harvesting very quickly so creds are king naturally uh, every red teamer knows this credentials are a red teamer's best friend and when we have plain text passwords it opens up multiple doors for us uh, without creds um, without plain text creds um, we have other options like hashes and tickets but uh, I mean, <laughs> there's nothing quite like good old plain text passwords, right? Uh, every red teamer needs to use some sort of credential harvesting uh, tooling uh, in their red team operations. This is because uh, in order to achieve our objectives, we, we do need to steal credentials and make our way to some level of uh, escalated privileges to complete our objectives. Now, modern defenses have caught on to this trend and made life harder for uh, real world attackers and consequently red teamers. But uh, overall, of course, this is a good thing. We want this to be hard because we don't want it to be easy for the real world bad guys. So certain techniques that uh, have been used are extens extensive signatures itself for the credential harvesting tools so um, we now know that defender does very very well against mimikatz uh, and by mimikatz i mean just the word mimikatz uh, you can have the word mimikatz in a uh, in a harmless program and it would still be uh, detected um, as malicious which uh, which I have no complaints against it is a, it is a good thing because uh, nothing legitimate comes out of anything called maybe cats but uh, this is a strategy that they've chosen to go with and I respect that so uh, a few other techniques that we have seen being used are user land API hooking uh, so specific API's like uh, read process memory um, and sometimes uh, open process on the um, LSAS process itself have proven to be uh, suspicious or detectable by a certain EDR vendors uh, and of course there is the protected processes light which is an OS level mitigation uh, Alex Ionescu has a great blog post series on uh, PPL if you're interested to get into the details and internals so what is API hooking? Uh, think of it uh, as a man-in-the-middle attack by the EDR product. Um, as you can see in the image, uh, main.exe is using the create remote thread API call, but this API call is hooked. So what actually happens under the hood is that there's a jump instruction that hijacks the execution flow. Uh, 
and this jump instruction takes the flow of execution to uh, the process space of the EDR um, and its DLL. So uh, once it's uh, in the um, process space of that DLL, it will then perform its checks. It will look at the function call. It will look at the arguments. It will see if the parameters are safe. If if it's if it's fine, then it decides that execution can resume. If it deems it as suspicious, then it will either generate an alert or outright block it. Certain other techniques that are, have been publicly uh, documented are unhooking these userland API hooks using uh, direct access calls to uh, ntdll.dll. Uh, so what we want to do here is that we want to use the very same hooked API calls, but we want to use the underlying uh, ntdl function call with the help of syscalls in ASM. So in order to do this, uh, you first need to resolve the syscalls from ntdll and then jump directly to the ntdll call. Another alternative that uh, is publicly uh, documented is getting creative with certain Win32 APIs. For example, the PSS Capture Snapshot API. This uh, API takes the this function takes the snapshot of the LSAS process, and what happens is you can then use the mini dump write dump function on the snapshot of LSAS instead of LSAS itself. So you're essentially creating a copy and uh, performing all your malicious activity on the copy and not the original. So this tends to evade certain detections that rely on your um, getting a handle on LSAS and uh, reading the process memory of LSAS itself. So uh, in some occasions you'll also see LSAS running as PPL. This is something that you can um, observe from the registry key um, and this registry key is run as PPL as, as you can see in the image. With run as PPL <coughs> enabled your um, excuse me your options will be limited to dropping a vulnerable preferably signed kernel driver and this vulnerable kernel driver will allow you to execute code in kernel space and this in turn will allow you to load another kernel driver of your choosing so something like uh, mimi drv.sys which is the kernel driver which uh, is created by the um, creator of mimi gets and if the vulnerable driver is unsigned, then you would need to use the vulnerable driver to first disable driver signing enforcement, then load your driver, and then dump credentials. Um, there's a lot more to this talk, but it's uh, outside this. Uh, there's a lot more to this topic. I'm sorry, but it's it's outside the scope of this this talk and uh, the time frame of this talk. Uh, but typically loading drivers on production environments is uh, deemed risky and if you want to do this then you should request permission beforehand because ultimately we are a red team we are not the real adversary we don't want to cause blue screens of death uh, on, on production environments and as an attacker of course uh, the concept of offense in depth is important to us because uh, we need to know different techniques to achieve the same goals because um, if one technique does not work or if one technique has been patched then you should have the knowledge of uh, different ways to achieve the same result which finally brings us to being a red teamer in 2020 and how this has changed in the past few years So uh, to begin with, the training landscape for red teaming is ever-changing. There are very few course courses out there. Uh, there are a few good ones, of course, uh, and that number is slowly growing. Uh, but most of the, uh, the mainstream courses have little or no focus on skills that will enable you to walk into a red team role. 
and um, like like pen test rules as well there's the catch-22 of uh, red team rules requiring experience and you needing a job in order to get experience in the first place so what is the best advice I would give to myself if I had to do it all over again I would very very strongly recommend watching Rafael Maggio's red team operations video series um, I mentioned earlier that this is a nine part video series it's based on Cobalt Strike but it will teach you the fundamentals of red team tradecraft and most red team roles will require you to fully understand the ins and out of cobalt strike anyway so it's a win-win uh, the best part is that it's free um, and there are two such series that i strongly recommend one is the red team operations um, as i mentioned and the other is the in memory evasion video series uh, which talks about some of the the features that uh, beacon has recently implemented which help with keeping it OPSEC safe in memory. So once you're familiar with a mature C2 framework, uh, I would recommend that you build your own from scratch. A very basic one, it doesn't have to be something sophisticated, but building one yourself will go a long way in helping you understand uh, the nitty gritties of um, implants and uh, C2 frameworks. Um, and Rasta Mouse has a, a very informative uh, video series on the development of Sharp C2 that's, uh, that is currently ongoing and uh, I've seen that Rasta Mouse is uh, very regularly posting videos to this playlist. I would also strongly recommend reading through Dominic Chell's post on learnings from a decade of red teaming. Um, he talks about what he has learned in uh, in an entire decade of red teaming and there's some very uh, useful insight for someone who's been around for over a decade and uh, definitely give that one a read also watch will burgess's talk on red teaming sorry will if i butchered your last name uh, this is a very informative talk it pushed the envelope in favor of red teams uh, very very significantly and the three uh, the three pillars of EDR that I kept mentioning throughout the talk uh, are something that Will's talk has also addressed. Also, you would want to master every attack vector on the Active Directory. So uh, for that, there's there's no better place than going to Harm Joy's blogs and tweets, and also Pyrotex tweets and uh, adsecurity.org which is a fantastic resource for all things AD and security. Learn about process injection. You can typically do this for free because there are plenty of resources out there but I have been made aware of a course by Pentester Academy um, and it's being taught by Pavel Yosefovich himself which uh, is going to be uh, a very promising course and uh, that's something that I might look at taking up as well. Um, I also want to mention that I'm, I'm not paid to sponsor any of these trainings or any of these uh, materials. This is uh, an independent and unbiased recommendation. Um, and lastly, learn how to set up your C2 infra, then automate it for speed and efficiency you can use terraform ansible there are plenty of ways there's a lot of uh, devops uh, influence on recent uh, c2 infra deployment and uh, a lot of people have found very innovative ways to do this so keep an eye out keep reading never stop learning so a huge shout out to the people who make their research public and push the envelope to improve security uh, this is the short list and uh, I'm, I'm quite confident that there are a lot more out there who have contributed and uh, thank you all for all your work and uh, image credits of the A12 Archangel and SR71 to the good people at Langley
Right, so now I'll open the floor for questions. Please post all your questions on the Discord server. Thank you all once again for watching my talk. Feel free to reach out to me on Twitter and have a nice day.